Antarctica is a big, empty, icy, powerful place that has an enormous ability to make you feel small. And although it's an icy world, there's also lots of rock, and that makes it a good place for geologists. I got to accompany three geologists there in December of 2007, Cooley Assistant Scientist Adam Sewell, graduate student Andrea Burke, and senior scientist Mark Kurz. We went to an extinct volcano called Mount Morning on the Antarctic mainland, about 800 miles from the South Pole. Also with us was Chris Linder, our indomitable photographer, who took all these great photos, including me here with Antarctic dirt on my nose. So it's an odd feeling to be left by a helicopter on a patch of lava in the middle of Antarctica. Up till then, you've been totally taken care of by the support crew at McMurdo Station. And then suddenly, it's just the five of us. The sun never goes down, and by the time we had camp set up that first day, it was about 10 at night. You can tell here because our shadows are pointed almost due north, and they just rotate around us all day, counterclockwise. It's just phenomenal to find yourself on these broad, empty plains of broken lava. We were in the middle of a layer cake of three different lava flows, aged 300,000 years, 150,000 years, and then this red one, which was just 25,000 years old. It's just been sitting here ever since it erupted with the wind gnawing away at it. And no plants to burrow roots into it, no running water to make canyons, no soil to cover it up. That's why geologists love it. Everything they're interested in is right out in front of them. The wind was a nearly constant presence out there. People always ask how cold it was in Antarctica, but the truth is it was pretty warm, even above freezing sometimes. But when the wind pours down out of the south, we cool off fast. Here, we're huddled out of the wind on a day when it was blowing about 50 miles an hour, pressed up against these black basalt pillars and eating chocolate bars. The wind basically never stops. You can see it in the grooves it's carved in the rock itself. All these channels that Andrea's walking on were chewed out of solid lava by specks of dust driven by gales. For this lava flow, it must have taken, well, about 150,000 years. I was fascinated by the way the wind had decorated the flows with rocks and tucked pebbles away into every nook and cranny, no matter where they were or how small they were. Field geology, it turns out, involves a lot of pounding at rocks with larger and larger hammers. Mark, Adam, and Andrea would bash off a chunk and hold it up close like a chipmunk with a nut, peering at it with a magnifying lens to identify the crystals. They were mainly looking for deep green shards of olivine, a mineral that Mark can use to measure how long a rock has been exposed to the elements. This is Adam's high-tech addition to the toolkit, a big yellow cube called a LiDAR that takes very accurate 3D pictures of the landscape. It was Adam and Andrea's job to haul this 80-pound box, that's worth $100,000, over the ankle-breaking gravel and up to the top of the tallest boulder on the lava plain, where it had an unobstructed view. That day, the wind was starting to build, and it was already pretty cold out in the open. The gusts worsened over the next week, until walking began to feel like barging through an imaginary crowd of Christmas shoppers. In the end, it spelled trouble for our kitchen tent. We loved that giant Antarctic oven, because it had space, it had headroom, places to sprawl out, a makeshift table, and with two stoves melting snow most of the time, it was warm. But Mark, the four-time Antarctic veteran, was constantly worried about how the big, blocky tent would hold up in a real windstorm. And he was right. In the height of the storm, the wind snapped a two-inch tent pole clean in two, and the geologists had to retreat to their triangular Scott tents. That was just two days after Chris and I had left, catching a helicopter ride during a lull. The three geologists had another month to go.